Good evening, everyone. My name is Pauline McIntosh, and on behalf of St. Francis Xavier University, I would like to welcome you to the Topshi Memorial webinar series. St. FX University and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour acknowledge that we work in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wallisquick Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We strive for respectful partnerships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation. We also acknowledge that Nova Scotia is home to over 50 African Nova Scotian communities whose culture, heritage, and histories have been and remain a key part of this province for more than 400 years. For generations, people of African descent have experienced inequities due to systemic racism in Nova Scotia and still do today. We strive to listen to and learn from the first voice perspectives of Black Nova Scotians, amplify Black voices, support Black communities, and address inequities and injustices in our work together. It is my pleasure to welcome you on the eve of the National Day of Mourning, marked annually in Canada on April 28th. The National Day of Mourning is dedicated to remembering those who have lost their lives or suffered injury and illness on the job or due to a work-related tragedy and committing to improving health and safety in the workplace. Before we proceed with this evening's webinar, please know that it is being recorded, re recorded and shared on the organizer's social media platforms. The Topshi Memorial webinar series is sponsored by the Topshi Memorial Fund, which was established in 1984 to honor the memory of Reverend George Topshi. Topshi was the director of the St. FX Extension Department and the Cody Institute. He worked to maintain close links to organized labor, cooperators, and credit unions. Topshi saw workers in their trade unions and consumers and producers in their cooperatives and credit unions as part of the same cause for social justice and economic democracy. I will now call upon Hugh Gillis, Secretary Treasurer of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor to bring greetings on behalf of the Federation. Hugh? Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to bring greetings this evening on behalf of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor and all of our 70,000 hardworking men and women who work across this great province. We're very proud of our relationship with the Cody Institute and St. of X University, and we thank them very much for this partnership that we have with the uh, Federation of Labor. It's a great way to reach many Nova Scotians in their homes in the evenings where they can listen in on to a number of uh, series of, of seminars. So we're very pleased uh, with this partnership and uh, we're very pleased to be here tonight. I wanna thank all the panelists who've agreed to come, uh, thank our moderator, of course, and of course, everyone who, who's joined us today. And as our moderator has said, Pauline, if you're unable to join tonight, it will be recorded and you will be able to go on next week and, and listen to it. So before we go any further, I'm gonna ask that we do a one moment of silence. Thank you. And I'm gonna turn things back to our moderator. Thanks, Pauline. Thank you, Hugh. 
Uh, before I introduce tonight's speakers, I will say a few words about the process. Each of our presenters will have seven minutes to speak, and I'll ask you, the audience, to type any questions that you may have into chat. And after all three speakers have, have delivered their presentations, uh, we will have some time to uh, respond to the questions that you've presented. Uh, also, if you have any technical issues this evening and get kicked out of the webinar for some reason, disconnected, uh, please go back to the original link for the webinar uh, and rejoin. If your technical issue is happening during the webinar, uh, please send a message in chat to Brian Lazuri, who is providing technical support this evening, and Brian will help you uh, however he can. Uh, and, and before we go any further, I would like to say I'm very, very pleased to welcome our speakers. We'll hear from Hugh Gillis again. And we also have Rachel Barber and Fred Jeffers with us this evening. And I will start by welcoming Hugh Gillis back to the mic. Hugh is Vice President of the Nova Scotia Government and General Employees Union, the largest union in Atlantic Canada. Hugh is a member of the Public Service, Public Service Superannuation Plan Trust uh, with fiduciary responsibilities for $13 billion in assets. He is Vice Chair, Board of Directors, United Way Cape Breton, and Secretary Treasurer with the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor. Hugh holds an undergraduate degree from Cape Breton University and is a resident of Cape Breton Island. Welcome, Hugh. Thank you. I'd uh, like to speak, uh, starting off about the day of mourning. So the National Day of Mourning for Workers, Injured or Killed on the Job, is observed on April 28th every year in Canada. The theme for the day of mourning in 2023 is a health and safety is a right, not a privilege. Emphasizing the importance and safety of healthy workplaces for all workers. By raising awareness, and advocating for workplace safety, we can help prevent uh, further future injuries and deaths on the job and ensure that workers can go home safely to their families at the end of each day. The day is dedicated to honoring and remembering workers who have been injured or killed on the job and raise awareness about the importance of workplace safety. The day of mourning was first observed in 1984 by the Canadian Labour Congress and has since been recognized by the Government of Canada in many organizations such as unions. Various national-wide ceremonies, speeches and gatherings include candlelight vigils, moments of silence, flag-raising ceremonies to mark the event. On April 28th, the Canadian flag is flown at half-mass at all federal government buildings and many public buildings as a sign of respect. Workers and their families, our unions and other advocacy groups participate in events and activities to raise awareness about workplace safety issues and demand better working conditions. The day also serves as a reminder to employees and government agencies to ensure workplace safety regulations are followed and to provide workers with the appropriate training and equipment. In Canada, approximately a thousand workers are killed annually, and many more are injured or become ill due to workplace hazards. The day of mourning is part of a global movement to promote workplace safety and protect workers' rights. The International Labor Organization, the ILO, observes April 28th as the World Day for safety and health at work. And many countries worldwide observe a similar day of remembrance and awareness. April 28th is a day to raise awareness about the dangers of workplace hazards and the importance of workplace safety. It provides an opportunity for workers and unions to remember and honor those injured or killed on the job. It serves as a reminder to employers and government agencies to prior, prioritize workplace safety regulations and to provide workers with necessary training and equipment to do their job safely. It empowers workers to speak up about workplace safety concerns and demand better working conditions. It highlights the needs 
for stronger worker protection laws and regulations to prevent workplace injuries and fatalities. It demonstrates the solidarity among workers and unions across Canada, showing that they can stand together to fight for better working conditions and workplace safety. It inspires action and activism, encouraging people to improve workplace safety and advocacy for worker rights. I would encourage everyone, if they're in the capital region, to come to the grounds of the Nova Scotia Legislature tomorrow. We will begin a service outside at 11 o'clock. We will have representatives from the government, uh, from opposition parties, from workers' compensation, from folks from Threads of Life, and additional speakers. And at the end, we will be laying flowers as a sign of respect. There will also be activities outside of the Capitol, and there will also be an online service as well. So that's a, an overview of the day of mourning. And uh, I'm going to turn things now back to our moderator. Thanks so much, Hugh. It's really, uh, you've really brought home to us how important how it is important that we is that have we a have day where we actually consider the impacts of unsafe workplaces on workers and on, on, on people and the families that, that are so unfortunately touched uh, by injuries and accidents that can sometimes happen in our workplaces and spaces. Um, and the importance of really having a day so people can feel free to come forward and to share concerns that they have and to recognize that it's such an important issue that we still need to do a lot of work in this area as we go forward. So thanks so much for, for raising those points and for letting us know what's going to be happening tomorrow um, in the Capitol related to the National Day of Mourning. And as you mentioned, there are certainly other activities happening around the province as well. Thanks, Hugh. I will now introduce Rachel Barber, Office of the Worker Counselor for the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor. Rachel is a longtime labor activist. She started her career as a claims manager in the Workers' Compensation Board of British Columbia. There, she became involved in her union and in the broader labor movement, where she dedicated herself to preventing injuries and to fighting for fair compensation for injured workers. In 2015, Rachel joined the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor's Worker Counselor Program. This program provides assistance, education, and advocacy relating to occupational health and safety and workers' compensation systems in Nova Scotia. Rachel brings a great deal of experience and expertise in both occupational health and safety and workers' compensation matters. Rachel, we're delighted to have you with us this evening. Welcome. Thank you so much, Pauline. I'm delighted to be here, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak about my passion, occupational health and safety. Um, I'd like to thank St. FX University, uh, the Cody Institute, and the Top Chi Memorial Fund, and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor for this opportunity. Um, my current role at the Office of the Worker Counselor is providing assistance, advice, and education on occupational health and safety and on workers' compensation. Um, needless to say, my past experience as a caseworker at workers' compensation in British Columbia, um, combined with my experience at the Worker Counselor, has given me plenty of opportunity to witness the consequences of workplace injury and disease. More than most folks, I am aware of the risks and the hazards that are faced by the working class every single day as they leave their homes to earn a living. Um, essentially, everywhere I look, I see ways to die. Uh, I am well aware, though, that most people don't view the world in the same way. And that becomes the challenge that we have in occupational health and safety. How do we have workers understand and appreciate the risks that they are taking and that they are facing in the workplace? How do we communicate to the regulators and to the employers that those risks and hazards are unacceptable? In the education I do, um, 
we provide a lot of educational workshops on occupational health and safety. And one thing we always present in our workshops is the concept that every single accident can be prevented. Typically, that's really difficult for people to wrap their heads around and very few people want to accept that every single accident can be prevented. So we ask our participants to come up with some examples of an accident that is not preventable. Um, invariably, our participants come up with either an elaborate chain of events that it would seem no one could foresee, or they mention lightning strikes or natural disasters, um, leaving aside the fact that lightning strikes and natural disasters are hazards that can be controlled. Um, the bottom line is that that is not how people are dying in our workplaces. In reality, people are dying at work in Canada from the most mundane um, accidents. Every year it's the same. They're falling off of roofs. They're being crushed by heavy equipment. Um, they're being involved in motor vehicle accidents. These are always the things that are happening in our workplaces and it just simply never changes. I think not only am I more aware of the hazards that face us every single day, I'm also more aware of the impact that occupational illness and disease has. Um, and I'd like to tell you about a few clients that I've encountered in the course of my career. Um, I'd like to tell you about the young man the young man whose leg was amputated in a cement mixer and I went to visit him in the hospital and this young man still had a sense of humor. It was early on in his injury and I don't think he had any idea what he was in for over the long haul. I'd like to tell you about the young woman. Um, her pelvis was crushed by a forklift in an accident in the workplace. Again, I saw her, it was early on in the, in the um, injury. And in her case, she already knew some of what she'd lost. Uh, she had been told by the doctors that she would never have children. I often wonder what happened to those two young people um, and where they are now and how they've managed. Uh, I imagine they faced a lot of challenges over the years. One example of someone who really stays with me, though, is uh, a man with mesothelioma. He had been recently diagnosed with mesothelioma, which is a lung disease that is terminal. He came into our office to ask for help in making plans for his wife after he died. Um, he knew exactly what he was in for. He knew what he was facing and he did everything that he could to plan for it and to make sure that his family was going to be okay when he was gone. Um, he, we managed to get him a payout um, in the end and he had planned to use that to take the dream trip with his wife that they'd always imagined. He didn't make it. He didn't make it to the trip. You know, every time these things happen, uh, they are greeted with shock as well as horror. As though we couldn't have seen this coming. As though no one could have known what was going to happen. The injury, the illness, the death. Every single year in Canada, a thousand people are dying in our workplaces. Those numbers are not getting better. It has been a thousand people every year for decades. It is not getting better despite all of the best intentions of our regulators, of our employers, despite all of the investments, the advances in safety research and technology. This is not getting better. So what do we do? What do we do to change what is going on? Essentially, our workplaces are a battleground. People are going to work every day and they are dying and they are being injured and their lives and the lives of those around them are being devastated. 
So how do we change what's going on in the workplaces? And I'd like to propose that the way to change this is to take action ourselves. This is up to us. This is up to those of us, the members of the working class, the ones who put our lives on the line to go to work every single day. Each and every one of us can make a difference. Mother Jones has a very famous quote, we need to mourn for the dead and fight like hell for the living. The day of mourning every April 28th is one piece of that uh, quote from Mother Jones. It's one piece of what we need to do. We need to remember those who have died. We need to memorialize them. We need to understand the impact that this is having on that young man with no leg, on that young woman who will never have children, and on the family of the man who died before he could go on the trip of his lifetime. So we need to mourn those people, but we can't forget the part about fighting, and that fight needs to carry on every day, not just on April 28th. We need to talk to our employers. We need to talk to the government. We, as the working class, need to take responsibility and we need to start taking action so that that 1,000 people dying every single year and the countless of others who are being devastated by injury and disease. So those numbers end so that nobody is dying in the workplace any longer. Um, we need to be understanding and learning about our right to a safe and a healthy workplace. We need to understand our responsibilities and our roles in maintaining a healthy and safe workplace. Um, we need to know our rights under occupational health and safety legislation. We have the right to know about the hazards in our workplace. We have the right to participate in occupational health and safety in our workplace. Place, and we have the right to refuse unsafe work. Anyone who has questions about occupational health and safety can contact the Office of the Worker Counselor and speak with me or my colleague, another worker counselor in the office. Um, we'd be happy to answer their questions. Um, I really hope that this April 28th, everyone takes a moment not just to mourn for the dead, but also to commit themselves to fighting for the living because a healthy and a safe workplace is not just a privilege. It is a right, a right that we all have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rachel. You have given us so much to think about and you've uh, delivered your message in such a poignant uh, way that I'm, I'm sure that we will all take a great deal away from what you've shared with us. Um, you know, starting with your opening statement that when people enter the workplace, they are entering a place of risk. Most of us probably don't think about it that way. You went on to say that we have to educate and raise awareness with workers, with regulators and employee employers. Uh, it certainly came to mind for me that sometimes people who are self-employed aren't providing the safest workplace um, either. Um, that every accident can be prevented. I, I don't think I will ever forget that most workplace accidents are not caused by lightning strikes and natural disasters. Uh, you, you've just made that so clear for us. Um, that not only are we talking about death, but we are talking about injury and illness uh, that rob people of the, the dignity of their life as well. And that we need to mourn for the dead and fight like hell for the living. Uh, the words of Mother Jones. That's, uh, it's absolutely shattering to think that there is still over a thousand people who die each year in workplace accidents and that this isn't changing. Um, regardless of how many April 28ths we come together uh, to remember the dead and the people who've been injured, uh, that we really do need to, to rise to, to the call to action that you've just put out for all of us. So thank you so much for, for sharing all of, all of your knowledge and experience with us. It's been truly powerful. 
And our final speaker for this evening, I would like to welcome Fred Jeffers. And, and, and Fred, I'm going to say I'm, I'm glad I'm not you right now because that's a hard act to follow. But I'm really glad that you're here with us, Fred, and that you are, uh, are going to join in this uh, panel of presenters this evening. Fred is from the Occupational Health and Safety Division of the Nova Scotia Department of Labor, Skills and Immigration. Fred started his career in the mechanical sector and worked in the construction industry for 18 years before moving to municipal government where he spent eight years with the engineering department in the town of Bridgewater. Fred joined the Nova Scotia Office of the Fire Marshal in 2011 and spent four years as the Provincial Fire Marshal prior to joining the safety branch in October 2020. Fred, welcome. Thanks very much, Pauline. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here this evening. Uh, it, it's great to be here. I'd like to start um, by thanking the Federation and their partners for organizing this webinar uh, and to thank everyone that's in attendance tonight. Um, we all know tomorrow is a very special day for us, and uh, I think it's really great for us to come together to recommit ourselves to workplace safety. And part of that is about remembering and honoring those folks who lost their lives over the past year at work. So thank you for that. Uh, so as Pauline said, I'm Fred Jeffers. I'm the Executive Director of the Occupational Health and Safety Division, and we're located in the safety branch at the Department of Labor, Skills and Immigration. And I'd like to talk just a little bit tonight, a little bit about the department and our division and the work that we do, and uh, maybe help folks understand a little bit about um, our role and how we contribute to, to occupational health and safety in the province. So the department itself, Labor, Skills and Immigration, you know, is really focused on helping people do a lot of different things. So prepare for job opportunities, build skills, uh, promoting safe work environments and helping employers and employees, you know, understand and know their rights and responsibilities. Um, they support people immigrating to Nova Scotia, which is, uh, we know is a, 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 big, uh, a big deal right now for us in the province. Uh, providing programs to help newcomers and provide career information and employment services, learning programs and, and other activities that support the labor market in, in, as a whole. So it's a pretty broad mandate, uh, but things connected very much together as well. So when you think about that, um, our department's responsible for, you know, making sure people are working safe and know their rights, uh, helping people find work and keeping work within the province. Uh, young people, helping young people get trained and work experience they need and, and helping more employers hire young workers. Uh, as well, the department works at things like improving access to labor market information and providing supports for things like furthering education or help with literacy or work experience, things of that sort. As well, um, the department works with partners and businesses to sort of identify labor and skills gaps. We've been hearing a lot about that lately uh, in some of, the, some of the sectors around the province. Uh, the department also regulates technical safety for mechanical equipment and, and equipment in um, public places like elevators and wiring and boilers and pressure vessels and cranes, those sorts of things. So interestingly, again, you know, there's some very different pieces in what we do at the Department of Labor, Skills and Immigrations. But and to do this, uh, we have over 500 staff across the province uh, working together, you know, on these on these various uh, various tasks. Very specifically, uh, within the safety branch itself, where we're located, um, we have a couple of divisions that are that kind of do all their work together: a strategic planning and accountability division that oversees things like our policy work, working on you know, new regulations, that sort of thing, uh, data collection and analysis, which is a big part of how we, how we can plan our do our, to do our work, uh, risk management, you know, measures and accountability. How do we know that the work we're doing is, is having an impact and, and being effective? Uh, the technical safety division uh, works with partners and clients to achieve compliance with legislation and regulations around those things I mentioned, boilers and pressure vessels and elevators and cranes and amusement devices, things like that. And then of course, finally, last but not least, uh, at least the Occupational Health and Safety Division, uh, it, we really administer and enforce the OHS legislation in Nova Scotia across provincially regulated industry sectors. So in both technical safety and occupational health and safety, uh, we really work to achieve our mandates through the application of what we refer to as our pathways to compliance, which sort of separates our work into four key pillars. And it's really about working with our partners to ensure that they, you know, there are clear safety rules in place in the province that people can access and understand. Um, we carry out education and promotion activities. 
to help educate employers and employees and on, on what specific requirements are, what their rights and responsibilities and, and roles are in occupational health and safety. Uh, of course, a big piece of the work is verifying compliance. So out there monitoring and in inspecting equipment and workplaces and public spaces. And then finally, when necessary, to take the, necessary, the, the appropriate steps to enforce compliance uh, when needed. So of course, that doesn't mean we have the capability to, to be out in every workplace every day in the province. Uh, for our division, it's really important that we prioritize our work so that we're really concentrating our efforts to where they're needed the most. Um, and to do that, it means that each year our team carries out a, quite a bit of analysis with a lot of different data to, to look at uh, what our work plan needs to be for the upcoming year. What are the sectors that we wanna spend more time in? Um, and this way we can focus our compliance and investigation outreach and technical teams more efficiently to have the greatest impact we can. Um, you know, as part of that planning, we, we set specific goals and targets that we want to achieve. And of course, that's all very flexible. There are, you know, things that come up that we have to, that we have to deal with, but it's, it's good for us to have some uh, clear goals and make sure that we're, you know, reaching those clients that need us the most. So that's kind of who we are and what we do uh, in a nutshell. But, um, you know, before I finish, I'd just like to say a little bit about, um, I really think one of the key components for us, it's, it's great to hear from Hugh and Rachel about uh, the work that their organizations are doing and our other partners. Um, it's, it's so important, I think, for us to consider that we all have a role to play when it comes to workplace safety. Uh, each of us here this evening, the panelists and, and the guests online, all the workers and employers out there across the province, um, all the different sector organizations and unions and workers' compensation board and the other organizations that are involved in occupational health and safety, you know, we all represent a different part of this overall goal. And even though we have separate roles and responsibilities, um, at the end of the day, we really all want the same thing. And that's for all our workers to go home safe and healthy at the end of their workday. So I'm really pleased to say that, you know, I think we're very fortunate here in Nova Scotia that we have all these different partners working together on this. Um, I know though we, we, you know, often come at it from a different angle or perspective, it's really gratifying for me to know that we're really all pushing in the same direction. Uh, we can all rely on each other and support each other in our work. And I'm, I'm very personally, very thankful for that, um, you know, for the folks that are here and others that help and support the work that we do. So it's a big, uh, it's a big undertaking. It's everyone's responsibility. We all have a role to play. And uh, it's, it's activities like this that help us get together and share the work that we do and help us understand how we can better lean in and, and do our part out. So uh, thank you again, folks, for being here this, this evening. And I look forward to some, some questions. Thanks so much, Fred. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for sharing a, a broader perspective on what the province is doing in order to combat uh, you know, dangers in the workplace. And, and you know, certainly many of the items that you've mentioned really are about prevention, it seems, uh, about education, awareness, taking responsibility, accountability, all of these things that are so important and help, uh, help build a collective impact, it seems. Um, I, I really appreciated how you started by mentioning that it's really important to remember all of the folks who have who have tragically lost their lives in the last year. And I, I should also acknowledge and thank you for leading us in a moment of silence at the beginning of this evening's webinar uh, to do just that. Um, I really appreciated what you said about uh, workers, um, you know, have have the have the right to work in safe environments, and that they need to know those rights. Um, as they enter those spaces. Um, and, and then some of the things that you talked about that really spoke to prevention uh, from, from, where, from where I'm sitting is uh, knowing about technical safety, knowing, uh, trying to increase, increase literacy so people are better able to communicate and understand not only the rights, but also potential uh, hazards in the workplace and how to mitigate the potential harm of those hazards. Uh, it was really interesting to hear that there are 500 staff working across the province uh, to help in this education awareness and, and compliance. Um, in thinking about uh, your safety branch and the strategic thinking and planning that goes into their work, as well as you know, the data collection, the impact measurement, uh, the risk management, all of the things that we do to assess the workplaces and see how improvements can be made. And finally, when you talked about the pathways to compliance and recognizing that they too are about education, about rights and responsibilities, about 
uh, verifying compliance and about um, enforcement. And it is really heartening to hear that while there are multiple perspectives, uh, even here this evening talking about this very, very important issue, that there is tremendous uh, collaboration and partnership, partnership in working toward keeping our workplaces safe for all. Uh, and it's that kind of shared vision, I think, that's really instrumental in, hoping, in helping us realize change um, as we move forward. So thank you so much, Fred, for, for bringing all of that to us this evening. I have put a note in chat that if anyone has any questions that they would like to pose, now is the time to do that. And while we're waiting uh, for folks to see if there's anything they'd like to ask uh, uh, one or all of you, I'm wondering, is there anything that you would like to comment on that you heard from, uh, from each other? So, you know, Hugh, is there anything you'd like to pick up on that, that Rachel or well, Fred shared and, yeah. and vice versa? What the other panelists have shared, and I want to emphasize to our listeners this evening, is that workplace safety is everyone's responsibility. Everyone has to take responsibility. Obviously, there's a greater emphasis, a greater uh, responsibility on the employer, but a safe space is for all of our employees, and it's important. I've worked as a correctional officer for more than 20 years. I know firsthand the importance of a robust uh, Josh committee at the work site. I know firsthand the importance of identifying uh, potential threats, unhealthy safety, uh, identifying the hazards. So it's very, very important, and that was said tonight, and it's it's important that workplace safety is everyone's responsibility. Great, thank you, Hugh. Rachel? Um, I was curious, Mr. Jeffers had mentioned that the Department of Labor and Advanced Education is involved in awareness campaigns and education. And I was hoping perhaps he could comment a little more on specifically what education is happening or what they're looking at doing. One thing we do find at the Office of the Worker Counselor is that when people contact us about occupational health and safety, their awareness of their roles and responsibilities under the legislation really isn't where it could be. And um, I think the education and awareness piece is something we work on as well. So I'm curious what the division has going on, Mr. Jeffers, if, mm. uh, if you could share that with us. Absolutely. No, that's a great question. Uh, so you're right. We find the same thing, Rachel, you know, to be honest, is that that's that's often one of the one of the shortcomings that we're finding in workplaces is that um, the average employee is not as aware of their role, their rights and their role, you know, their role in, in workplace safety. Right. Uh, so that's a big that's often one that we um, we push materials on when we have the opportunity. So there's a couple of things we've got on the go right now that are we're really excited about, it. and I might choke up talking about it. I'm so excited about it, I'll be honest with you. The um, next week, I believe it'll be next week, we're launching a, you'll hear about it, it'll be on the news. We're actually launching a an app, uh, a web-based app that you can use on your phone or your your computer, and it's a safety app. So it's called NovaSafe, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be occupational health and safety and our technical safety as well. And uh, we did it, we worked on it in conjunction with the Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety. And um, we're, we want to put, that's what we want to do. We want to put that information in people's hands in the workplace so that when they have any questions or concerns, uh, there's a number of components in it. We're going to keep adding to it and, and helping it grow. It's kind of written in more of a plain language guide of, of, you know, what to do and how you should do things. And, but it also has links to the legislation. So you can actually look it up in the legislation and see um, you know, what it says. And uh, so we're really excited about that. You'll be hearing about that. And that's one of the big pieces for us that, especially with, um, you know, when we think about uh, young workers uh, in the province, you know, that's a, that's a great way to kind of get the word out there to them. The other one that's been really big for us lately, um, there's two things really. So we also have our 1-800-9-LABOR number that we want folks to use and call in if they have questions. It's not just a a line to report occupational health and safety concerns. It's also a, you know, a, a line and a, an information line. 
And we also have our um, safety branch at novascotia.ca uh, website, which or uh, email address, which you can which you can call in as well. So we have information specialists that um, basically, you know, they answer all those calls that come in, and a lot of the calls are for information. What can I, you know, what what where can I learn about my roles and responsibility? And of course, we have a, a, a multitude of materials that we can we can share back out with them. Uh, that's another uh, another piece that we're we're quite pleased with how it's how it's happening during COVID. It was uh, it was amazing the the call volume went up by multiple multiple to up ten. I mean, it was amazing the number of calls we got. But it was really a lot of people really appreciated the fact that they had a place that they could call and get those you know basic pieces of information about how to stay safe at work. Uh, the other the other big piece uh, that's been great for us is with uh, when when immigration came over and joined labor and skills. So it uh, not that we couldn't have done it before, but having them in the house with us was was uh, amazing. It's been an amazing experience for us, particularly with the the number of newcomers coming to Nova Scotia over the past few years. And one of the big concerns for us, uh, understanding that people are coming from different countries where occupational health and safety is different than it is here, uh, how it's looked upon, um, regulatory regimes are different in other in other parts of the world, uh, and and we get lots of folks coming here that may not have English as a first language. So we really it was really important for us to be able to uh, start to you know do some things to make sure that those newcomers coming to the province could access the information they need and understand um, you know what they needed to understand to keep themselves safe in their new jobs. That they got here. So working very closely with ISANS, um, a couple of different initiatives that we've been doing. But one of the big ones was just translation uh, services. So we've um, we've been translating a lot of materials or some of our materials into uh, a number of different languages. I think we're up to almost ten now, and they're the ten most most common ones in the province for for folks that are coming in. And the other one is. Um, providing translation services to our officers in the field. So we have a service available to our officers 24-7, uh, whereby they can reach out if they are in a workplace, uh, they're working with a, a business owner or they're working with an employee and they wanna be sure that um, they're able to communicate with them and share information with them. They have that service available to them that they can reach out and get those translation services at a moment's notice. So. That's been really helpful for us to have that in our back pocket, uh, just to make sure we can reach those people. That's a big piece now for us is, you know, making sure that it, everyone can get access that information that they want. So those are a few things that we've we've been kind of working on over the past couple of years that are new and hopefully innovative. And uh, we're looking forward to the app getting up and running and out there. so much for that. I think the app will be an amazing resource. I noticed someone in the chat made the comment that it's terrific news. So I have to agree with Lori. That's terrific news. I think it'll be fabulous. It's great. I will add, I will add too, Colleen, that uh, Fred Jeffers has been uh, in speaking with the Federation of Labor. Our offices are an executive council, and we look forward to having Fred back, uh, bringing us up to date on some of the things that he just talked about as well. And so we will, when we get that information, we'll be sharing it with all our affiliates. Great, thanks, Hugh. And uh, Rachel mentioned the chat, so I think I'll just read a couple of the comments that are there. There's one from Nicole Turple, who says, no questions, but uh, thanks to all of the panelists for taking the time to speak with us. The personal stories shared from Rachel were very impactful. All employees must practice due diligence related to occupational health and safety. Thank you all again. I think education re regarding occupational health and safety committees or OHS reps need to be highlighted more across the board, both unionized and private workplaces. I love the app idea, definitely positive for younger workers. So some good affirmation and appreciation for what, what all three of you shared with us this evening. Um, Eileen Alma has a question. She's asking, uh, some of the health and safety issues are those we might be aware of, especially in the trades like construction. However, are there also emergent safety issues that are newly concerning you might not have expected would be on the rise? So I, I guess the question is, are, are, are either of the three of you encountering uh, new hazards or potential risks um, that might reflect our changing workplaces and spaces as well? 
Um, if I could comment, no, I'm not an expert on, on the statistics on these topics. Um, and I don't think it's a new issue, but it certainly is an emergent issue. And that relates to psychological health and safety. Um, we are now seeing um, a great deal of workers who have been injured psychologically, whether they've been subject to a trauma in the workplace and have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, or if they've been the victim of bullying and harassment, and as a result have developed a depression or an anxiety disorder, that's something that we're seeing a lot more of. And I think that's because awareness is increasing. Um, and I know that from a workers' compensation board perspective, they are making some changes slowly to how they address psychological injuries. So I think folks should stay tuned for some uh, hopefully improvements in the way we address psychological injuries in the workplace and um, and how that is impacting folks. Great, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Rachel. I I'd just like to add too, um, in a in a, probably in a much much larger perspective, our province is growing. We're over a million people. Our work. We have more. Uh, new Canadians, more immigrants coming to our province, uh, different languages, there's language barriers. And we have to understand that the culture that some folks have come from, uh, safety may have not have been their number one priority. So we have to factor that in going forward as well. So I, I just wanted to point that out. No, that's it. Uh, that's a go. Go ahead, Polly. Oh, no, no, I was just going to, I was just going to thank, thank Rachel and Hugh and ask if you had anything to add. Yes, no, I and I agree totally. You, you're you're right, and and Rachel as well. I, even to go back, Rachel too, with your original uh, your original presentation. Um, you know, I appreciated the the personal stories, and I think that that's um, just a bit of a sidebar. I think that's one of the things that we have to keep we have to keep talking about because that really, if there's anything that's going to drive occupational health and safety and, and change culture, it's it's helping people understand the impact and how it can impact them and their families and their communities, you know, when these things happen, right? Uh, but to the, back to the question, no, I agree. Uh, the, the psychological health and safety piece is is on our radar. Um, you know, our most, as in most jurisdictions, occupational health and safety legislation is was originally intended for those physical um, injuries or physical risks um, in workplaces. It was never really intended to to consider psychological and psychosocial hazards in the workplace. So that is definitely from our perspective as a regulator, we need to, we need to see what that needs to look like. So how can we, you know, because we need to be able to one of the, if you remember one of the pillars, it was about providing clear guidance on expectations for, for workplaces on what they need to do to be safe. So as the psychological health and safety unfolds and we see as it, where it's going and we're looking at it, we have to consider how we can capture that so that um, you know employers and workplaces and, and employees clearly understand what do they need to do? How do they, what's their role in that? And, and how do they do that? Um, other issues you know, that I think about, again, I, I agree with what you say, some things are necessarily not on the rise, but there's a few things on our radar. Um, falls is one. So there have been, there have been um, again, I'm not, I, I have to bring the numbers up to see the statistics, but it's certainly not going away. Uh, there, there's still too many uh, Nova Scotians getting injured and seriously injured in, in a lot of cases and losing their lives in a number of cases from falls. And as Rachel alluded to at the beginning, those in particular are very, very preventable. And um, so that's something that um, actually the, the Construction Safety Association has a uh, has a uh, initiative this year. They're doing they're going they're doing some some work in that area and. Uh, it's definitely on our radar to to um, to be a big part of our work plan. The other one that I just want to sort of put out there, and again, even Rachel goes back to what you were saying about um, uh, some of the folks you spoke of that had um, you know long term um, you know health conditions as a result of exposures, and that's about occupational health and and occupational exposures, and those are the ones that are a little different to think about because the impact isn't always seen 
it could be 20 years down the road before an individual starts to uh, suffer the consequences of a of a, an occupational exposure. So uh, that's another one that we are, you know, we're looking at to see what's where do we want to, you know, how can we how can we do more in that in that area to, um, you know, promote safety in the workplace when it comes to uh, exposures and those things that can cause occupational disease down the road. Um, you, we won't even if we do some great work in the next five years, you know, we may not see the results of it for 20 years, but it's it's one of those ones that's challenging to look at because of that. But it's uh, it's such a big one. And um, I think if you look at some of the statistics from workers compensation around uh, occupational diseases and cancers and things like that, we can see that it's an area that, um, again, it's not really emerging, but it's certainly one that's uh, top of mind. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you all for, for your comments uh, in response to Eileen's question and thanks to Eileen and, uh, and uh, Nicole for their, their, their comment and question. I, I'm wondering, you know, we, we've heard, um, you know, more, more discussion about psychological and emotional um, injuries than, than we've perhaps heard in the past. And uh, it may be too soon to, to tell or certainly too soon to have any definitive numbers, but coming out of the pandemic, where we heard a lot more about mental health struggles. We heard a lot more about addiction struggles. We heard a lot more about domestic violence, um, you know, as a result of the pandemic or maybe a greater awareness or greater instances of these things um, aligned with the pandemic. Is, is, are these trends uh, visible in your work as well as it relates to, to uh, worker safety and occupational health and safety? Um, I could comment on that a little bit. I, I honestly don't think it was the pandemic that has raised a lot of the psychological issues. It certainly raised awareness. It certainly raised awareness, I think, and people have become uh, more comfortable discussing their psychological issues. Uh, I think what has really started to increase the number of health and safety um, related inquiries and the number of workers' compensation claims was the relatively recent change in the legislation surrounding our first responders in this province. Um, it was some changes to the Workers' Compensation Act mm -hmm. that provided a presumption to first responders and emergency uh, employees who, where if they developed a post-traumatic stress disorder, but they were entitled to a presumption that that was caused by work. And I think those changes really resulted in a lot of people stopping and thinking uh, and, and beginning to conceptualize the fact that the workplace is not only a source of physical injury, it is also a source of psychological injury. I don't think the psychological injuries are new. I think they were always there. This is just my own opinion. But I think people are starting to come forward and to ask questions about those more. Um, and they're starting to think that maybe the employers do have to be responsible for that kind of injury in the same way that they are responsible for physical injuries. So it's certainly something that's kind of new. Um, I do think the pandemic contributed to the increase simply because it raised awareness. Interesting, thank you, Rachel. Yeah. And I would echo everything that Rachel just said. Uh, certainly as a correctional officer, the, some of the changes were very beneficial. We're seeing more correctional officers off on post-traumatic stress. And in the past, they looked at one particular incident now it's a cumulative. We know over time, if you're working more than 20 years, the trauma, the, it, it all adds up. So we're looking at it from a different perspective. So I, I would agree with everything Rachel just said. Interesting. Thanks yeah. to you, Fred. Yeah, no, and I, I agree. And I think the other thing that we're finding is that um, the um, there are things to do. You know, it's not totally, if, if you're, uh, I was, I spent... 30 years in the fire service as well. And, and uh, there's, you know, the, you're going to see things, it's part of the job, but there's a lot of great 
um, supports and strategies out there that can help you navigate that. So you are going to see and you're going to experience as part of your work. And there are a number of jobs like that, that that is part of the work they're going to experience. But there's some there are some, you know, um, there's some defense against that. There's some ways that that employers can support their employees to, um, you know, to work their way through that and get them the supports they need when they need them. And, and I think the other thing too, Rachel, I was uh, something you said made me think about um, one of the things that we've found out about is the, the psychological injury that often accompanies a physical injury. So you might have someone that suffers a physical injury at, at the workplace. They may not, there may not be any, uh, you know, psychological stresses there normally with their job, but being off, they're they're off work for a period of time and there's um you know there's they feel abandoned or they feel separated from their work or there are some things that can go along with that 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 now are getting associated without that recovery period or that time that they're off work that we need to consider as well they need to you know we, we need to get them healthy and, and back to work not just physically but psychologically too so um you know that's that's another piece that's sort of come to light, and I and the third one that, that came to mind for me, of course, was the uh, the harassment and bullying piece. So again, from a legislative perspective, you know we have violence in the workplace regulations, but again, they're really directed about the risks that end up in a physical, you know, a physical risk to the individual and not a psychological uh, injury that they may suffer because of bullying and harassment in the workplace. So there's a lot of different levels to this i think that we're going to see that we that we need to navigate going forward and and they'll all you know the beauty of this is that a lot of workplaces have already taken these on so there's there are a number of workplaces out there that have a harassment policy you know have a, a a policy around harassment and bullying um you know they have services emergency service providers have um you know supports and services for traumatic stress for uh, their police officers and firefighters and, and paramedics and so on. So a lot of it's we're we're, we're playing catch up on the legislation and, and what makes sense, which is a better place to be than than trying to uh, you know create something where there's there are no supports and there's no um, you know there's no tools for employers to 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 work through it. We're fortunate that there's lots of there's lots of great supports and tools out there that that employers will be able to lean on. Um, to help them get their programs, you know, going in where they choose to do that. And that's a really positive note to end on, Fred. Thank you for raising that. And, and, and just to highlight that there are resources out there for employers. There are resources out there for employees. Uh, you've mentioned many of them this evening. And, and perhaps as we close, we'll just encourage people uh, just to seek out that kind of support and to seek out those kinds of resources that may be helpful for them in their workplace. Yeah. So Hugh, Rachel, Fred, on the eve of the National Day of Mourning, I just want to say it has been such a privilege uh, to hear from each of you this evening. Uh, you've shared your experiences, your workplace insights, um, some of what has been achieved for workers already, and, and you've also given us a lot to think about in terms of the work that remains. So I really want to thank each of you sincerely uh, for being here with us this evening and bringing those messages. And before we go to the final wrap up, Hugh, I just want to offer you an opportunity to say something uh, as, as a representative, representative of our partner in this webinar series, the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour. Sure. A again, the, we, the Federation of Labour very much appreciates the partnership we have with Cody and, and St. of X University. It's a great way to reach out to our members across the province, for anyone really, and to just learn about these important topics and to share this information, it's been very successful. And if you're unable to join, we have people that registered that it will be taped and they will be able to go back and look at it again. So I would just, again, thank, uh, thank you for the, the great working relationship that we have. Well, it's a pleasure. And it's, it's certainly our pleasure to work with the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour to bring this important information, not only to your members, but we have a lot of folks uh, just from the public who come out and join for the webinars. And we're thrilled to have everyone coming together to learn in this way. So in addition to Hugh Gillis, Rachel, Bar Rachel Barber and Fred Jeffers, as well as Danny Cavanaugh, who is the president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour. And Danny had to be away this evening, but he very graciously helped with the organizing of this webinar as he's done with all of them in the past. Uh, a big shout out to Danny and uh, it's been a, certainly a delight to work with him as well. 
And there are people behind the scenes who make this webinar series a success as well. And I'd like to name them. Uh, Joan Wark from the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor and Brian Lazuri, Jenny McDonald and Susan Hawks uh, from Cody Institute who provide fantastic communication support. And again, I would like to acknowledge the Topshi Memorial Fund sponsorship of this event. And this is the last in our winter spring webinar series. Uh, from the Topshi Memorial uh, Fund. And on behalf of St. of X and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor, I'd really like to thank all of you who've joined in this four-part webinar series, uh, who've participated in these discussions, and, and I'd really like to encourage you to stay tuned uh, to hear what, might else, what else might be upcoming uh, in this year that's supported uh, by this particular uh, project and this program. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening and for all of the webinars. Uh, certainly been um, our pleasure to host you in this way and hope we will see you again uh, in the future. And I am Pauline McIntosh. And on, on that note, I will say good night to all of you. And I look forward to seeing you again. Good night, everyone.